All right, ginkgo, the form of ginkgo used in the United States is this uh, EGB761, uh, and it's used for improving circulation, it's moved for memory enhancement. It's ex extract from ginkgo biloba uh, tree leaves, and this is what it's made of, but it's basically an immunomodulator, and remember, inflammation of the central nervous system is the interface of the neuroimmune system. So anything that improves the functioning of the immune system should help with uh, functioning of the immune system in the brain as well, and thus reduction of inflammation. All right, neuro, it's neuroprotectant, okay? So it protects nerves. It downregulates the microglia, thus reduces the inflammatory component of the microglia, and it does a lot in terms of helping with uh, repair of cells. All right, again, we've seen clinical applications in post-ischemic stroke. We've seen it used for degenerate, neurodegenerative diseases, neuropsychiatric diseases, major depressive disorders, ADHD. All right, anxiety disorders, neuropathic pain, and migraine. So there's lots of clinical uses for these things. And there's not a lot of downside to them. Somewhere between 120 to 600 milligrams a day, but it will make coagulation worse. So that if you're taking an anticoagulant, you shouldn't probably take ginkgo. If you're taking ibuprofen, aspirin, in order to reduce your blood coagulation, ginkgo is going to make it worse. So you do need to pay attention when you're using these things. You have to watch not only for herb-herb interactions and herb side effects, but also for herb-drug interactions. And that's always the case. All right, phenolic compounds, bioactive non-essential nutrients from plants, they're abundant in fruits and vegetables. This is stuff that you're going to see in blueberries and raspberries, and all your colored fruits. They have lots of antioxidant activity. They scavenge free radicals. They arrest cell death, so they keep cells alive. Uh, the modulation of enzyme activities and detoxification, oxidation and reduction. There's a ton of good things they do, and they're neuroprotective. Okay, so eat your fruits and vegetables, the colorful ones. So that's the best place to get this stuff. But we can also get it by taking it in supplement form when we need higher concentrations. All right. So if we look at quercetin, it's a bioflavonoid found in fruits and vegetables, herbs, leaves, seeds, red wine, tea, coffee, beer, and several medicinal plants. But after beer, who cares about the medicinal plants? <laughs> <laughs> it's converted from rootin in the bloodstream. It inhibits cytokine release uh, from mast cells, meaning that it will reduce things such as you see inflammation associated with allergies. And then it's going to kick off the mast cells. All right. So it's cell protective, it's an antioxidant, antinociceptive, it reduces pain, okay? It reduces inflammation, it creates some analgesia, okay, uh, directly, and it's suppressive oxidative stress and inflammatory response in the microglia. Again, I'm always looking for a central effect of this stuff. Uh, it's been shown to be useful in neuropathic pain, not clear about fibromyalgia, in a number of neurodegenerative diseases, and in depression. Quercetin dosage is somewhere between 12 and a half to 25 milligrams, but they've gone to very high dosages in some people. But again, this can interact with blood thinners and it can also damage the kidney. So again, if you've got renal failure or renal insufficiency, you may not want to take this. If you've got problems where you're on anticoagulants, you may not want to take this. So you have to do this in conjunction with your healthcare provider. Curcumin. Curcumin's been all over the news, okay? It's the yellow pigment in turmeric and yellow mustard, all right? In Indian food, predominantly. All right, it mediates anti-inflammation, effects through downregulation of inflammatory transcription factors, enzymes, and cytokines. It promotes microglial anti-inflammatory phenotypes. It moves the microglia away from inflammation, okay, and more to a sessile state. It blocks the expression of tissue necrosing factor alpha. It reduces inflammation, it reduces, um, it's an antioxidant as well, all right? So it has antibacterial properties, antiproliferative. They're looking at this for treatment of cancers, reducing the proliferation of cancer cells. Anti-inflammatory and antiviral activity. It's been tried in a large number of conditions. It seems to work both centrally and proliferally as an anti-inflammatory. So you can use it for treatment of osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, but it's also been used against cancers and other neurologic diseases and cardiovascular diseases and like, why aren't we putting it in the water supply? 80 to 500 milligrams per day. 
And then there's a lot of different ways that different manufacturers have attempted to increase the bioavailability of the, of the uh, supplement, all right? And so some people have mixed it with black pepper. Uh, they've done phytosome complexes with phosphatidylcholine, uh, nanoparticles, water soluble. And so each of these have their effectiveness and uh, pretty much all of them have been subject to some studies, not a lot of studies, but some studies. Uh, it's cardioprotective effect, I'm sorry, resveratrol. Um, resveratrol is what I talked about earlier where they found, they uh, finished a study recently looking at reduction in amyloid plaque formation in people who have Alzheimer's. Again, will that reverse the Alzheimer's? We don't know. But we do know that it's affecting the pathologic process of it. Okay, so the next step is what happens with people when we actually are able to reduce it. But the first step was what does it do? It reduces plaque formation. <clears throat> so we're still exploring the mechanisms via which this works, but it clearly has a huge amount of impact in terms of reducing inflammation in the central nervous system. Uh, lovely place to get it from is grapes from peanuts, from raspberries, mulberries, pistachios. So diet is always the first choice. Supplements are the second choice. So a good, well-balanced diet is really what we want you eating. Lots of fruits and vegetables, lots of nuts. It's well absorbed after oral administration, but low bioavailability. What does that mean? It means that we absorb it well, but it doesn't get to all the other tissues particularly well. And so it has to be mixed with other things in order to get it into different tissues, liver, kidney, lungs, wherever you want to get it to. It's rapidly metabolized in the test in the liver. You also have to be, so this was more for the docs who I was speaking with, but this business of in vivo versus in vitro. There's lots of things we can do in cell cultures, okay, and they don't necessarily translate into what happens in human beings. All right, nevertheless, it's been touted for anti-cancer properties, antioxidant properties, keeping cells alive, this pro-apoptotic business, uh, anti-inflammatory, as an analgesic, and anti-aging. It'll do everything. Uh, it's been used for treatment of neuropathies, neuroprotection post-stroke, traumatic brain injuries, uh, adjunct with morphine to restore the anti nociceptive effects of morphine. This business of hyperalgesia it may be that if we start giving people resveratrol in addition to the morphine, we can keep the effectiveness of the morphine and not develop the hyperalgesia. Okay, so this is again looking at this possibility of using supplements to supplement our medications and get a better result with a lower dose of the medication. Does lots of things in the brain. It's been used for neuropsychiatric disorders. This modulation of the hippocampal plasticity and suppression of chronic low-level inflammation. Okay, that's a mouthful. The highest turnover of cells in the brain is in the hippocampal region. The hippocampal region is what converts kind of short-term to long-term memory. All right? There's a lot of other functions, but in simple terms, that's one way to look at it. The hippocampal region also regulates one of our stress responses. Because it turns out that cortisol, okay, which is released in response to stress in the body, while its regulation is from the hypothalamic region, it's the hippocampal region and the amygdala, two other areas of the brain, which actually regulate the hippocampus release. So when you've lost a lot of tissue in the hippocampal area, long-term stress, anything that creates damage in the brain will tend to hit the hippocampus first. So anything we can do to protect the hippocampus, we want to do, okay? And it looks like resveratrol is one thing that seems to protect the cells in the hippocampal region of the brain. Health benefits, dosing somewhere between five milligrams and five grams. Uh, and as I said, some compounds in, in contain uh, supplements to enhance the absorption of this stuff. Omega-3 fatty acids, okay, there's a lot of stuff that we have here, but this in the brain is what we focus on. There's been some discussions about whether or not omega-3s are helpful in the prevention of heart disease. I think that literature is open to interpretation, but I don't think the literature with regards to uh, its uh, help in terms of, of uh, brain health is open. I think that's actually pretty impressive that it clearly does help the brain. We need omega-3s in order to, re we need fats in order to build brain tissue. And what we're finding is depletion of DHA 
makes the brain more susceptible to degeneration. Certainly makes it more susceptible to uh, concussion injury. So anything we can do, we know that giving DHEA post-concussion, post-stroke, actually helps in the repair and the recovery. So we want to be using this for brain health. We know that there are good studies looking at this stuff uh, as an antioxidant, neuroprotective, but also for depression. And for depression, we use anywhere from a gram and a half to nine grams a day of omega-3s. This is more detail than you need, but this business of, po of protective post-stroke, traumatic brain injury, neuropathic pain, migraines, neurodegenerative diseases, neuropsychiatric conditions. There's a time and a place for this stuff, and we don't use it enough. How much do you use? It depends. So in the literature, it says anywhere from uh, 2, 3.5 ounces of oily fish servings per week. That'll get you your adequate amounts of omegas. All right? But is this the adequate amount of omega in order to legitimately talk about long-term health? And is that the right amount of omega depending upon what's going on in an individual day to day? So if I've got a teenager who's on optimal health, exercising all day long, and nothing wrong with them, that may be the right amount. But in those of us who have sustained a few more bumps and bruises throughout life, who have more inflammation going on in our brains, maybe we want to take a higher dose. So we argue that somewhere between one and a half to nine grams a day is the proper dose of omegas. I personally take a gram and a half a day every morning. And I eat a lot of fish on top of it. <clears throat> so it's produced vitamin D. Vitamin D is essential for the normal, healthy functioning of the immune system. Microglia are the innate immune system in the central nervous system. You ain't got vitamin D going on, you ain't got normal functioning microglia in the central nervous system. So you have to get, make, sh make sure you're getting adequate vitamin D levels. And we have finally come around in the literature to suggesting, you know, they went for the longest time, said 10 nanograms per milligram were, was adequate vitamin D levels. All right? Then we suddenly realized that, oops, wait a minute, that's not only deficiency, that's disease. So now we finally have increased those numbers. Let me see. This is all the stuff, and you have this stuff uh, handed out to you in terms of the things that what we see in terms of uh, low vitamin D levels and what happens to inflammation uh, in the body and the health of the body. Uh, we use it for neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative diseases. Low serum levels are especially common in people with severe pain and in uh, fibromyalgia. Um, each 10 nanogram per milliliter increase uh, results in a decrease in the DAS28 score, but more importantly, CRP. So the C-reactive protein is associated with heart disease. Okay, higher the CRP, the higher the risk of heart disease, although there's a point at which the higher the CRP, the higher the risk of other inflammatory diseases going on in the body. So when you start breaking above four on a CRP, you're probably looking at other inflammatory conditions, potentially cancers, sitting in the body. But adequate vitamin D levels reduce that. All right, we know that adequate vitamin D levels prevent the occurrence, or at least reduce the occurrence, of other cancers. And the reason for that is, <coughs> The body makes cancerous cells all the time. It's the job of the immune system to clean them up. All right, if the immune system is not functioning normally, it can't clean up those cancer cells. And thus, in people with low vitamin D, we start seeing an increased incidence of cancers. We also see an increased incidence of multiple sclerosis. The studies years ago found that people living in the equator had a lower incidence of multiple sclerosis compared to those living in northern hemispheres. We subsequently found that that's related to vitamin D levels. So the Institute of Medicine, we also see as you see decreases, significant decreases in vitamin D levels, your pain gets worse. The Institute of Medicine says you need 600 international units a day as a supplement, 800 if you're over 70. All right, that's in the executive summary. On the first couple of pages, it hit all the news. Nobody bothered to read to page 75. Page 75, it said, mm, you need 4,000 IUs a day uh, in order to maintain uh, normal health. Again, these are broad, broad strokes that we're painting here, and they're not about individuals. And so what we need to do is measure vitamin D levels and supplement you according to what you need. You may not need any supplementation. You also need a, may need a great deal. And specifically, we want to make sure that with vitamin D, we think the normal levels are somewhere between 30 to 100 nanograms per ml. All right? And there is a toxic level for D, so we don't want to get above that. 
But in our experience and my reading of the literature, 50 to 60 nanograms per ml is actually optimal health. And what we're trying to talk about here is optimal health. All right, so my recommendations, depending upon who you are and what, you're, what I'm treating, okay? Somewhere of omega-3s between a gram and a half to nine grams a day. Vitamin D, you wanna check blood levels and you wanna keep the levels between 50 and 60 nanograms per ml. Liposomal glutathione, we use a formula called Redisorb, which we use essentially a teaspoon twice a day. N-acetylcysteine, 600 milligrams three times a day. CoQ10, 100 to 300 milligrams three times a day. Ginkgo, somewhere between 240 to 600 milligrams a day. Curcumin, in our, in our case, we use a formula called Mariva at 200 milligrams once to two, one to two a day. Resveratrol, we use 500 to 1,000 milligrams a day. And melatonin, again, depending upon what we're treating. So what I wanna emphasize here is that it's the cocktail that's gonna be effective. You need to individualize what you're doing with this. You need to adjust it for people who have kidney disease or have other conditions that uh, you may not want to use certain supplements with. So you need to be thoughtful about the process. You can't just, you know, I'll take this handful of pills. Who are you giving them to? Why are you giving them? And how do you measure what your results are? All right. The other thing that I want to talk about is supplements in general because supplements are a problem. There's a huge number of supplements on the shelves that do not have in them what they say they have in them. So if they say they have 5,000 international units of vitamin D3, they may have 2,000 in some pills, they may have 6,000 in other pills, they may have none in others. The FDA does not regulate supplements, and that's the problem. And just earlier this year, they stormed into Target and GNC uh, and Walmart and demanded that they take off the shelves uh, their own name brand stuff, which by the way is pretty much all made by one manufacturer. Uh, because it didn't have it, what they said it had, and it had contaminants of things it didn't say it had, that they didn't bother to list. So this is a problem. The other part of the problem is you need to make sure that the form of the supplement you're getting is a bioactive form, meaning that it's able to be utilized by the body for the things that you want to utilize for. So <clears throat> this is a great big deal in trying to figure out how to manage these supplements and make sure you're taking some stuff that's good and not just taking stuff that's junk. All right, and it's a challenge because there are some websites that'll give you some insight, there's consumer sites that'll give you some insights as to uh, what supplements are, have been tested and are found to have in them what they say they have in them. Certainly, if you're taking fish oils, one way you can determine if the fish oils are good is you take a pen and prick one of them, dump out some of the oils. If it has a smell, it's rancid, throw it out. It's no good at all. Doesn't guarantee the quality beyond that, but at least we know it's not rancid. Fish oils shouldn't taste like anything. A hint for taking fish oils for people who have some reflux is if you keep them in the refrigerator, freeze them. If you take them uh, frozen, uh, it'll reduce the amount of reflux that you get associated with them sometimes. So we want to be careful about the supplements that we take. We have a small number of supplements that we sell through our, through our center. We have gone to the problem of checking out the manufacturer. We found out what their standard operating procedures are. We found out what their quality controls are. How do they keep track of, of what the shelf life of this stuff is? Do they just make it up or do they actually know because they've tested and retested it? So we try and do our due diligence as best we can and make sure that they have independent labs testing their products to make sure that they have in it what they say they have in it. And so it's, it's a chore to go through this because I know having gone through it with the manufacturers. And I, there's a lot of different manufacturers out there and you can't just because they're really good in producing one product doesn't mean they're gonna be great with the second product. And so we're constantly testing back and forth to get the best forms of the stuff that we can, we can locate. There are a lot of good people out there, and I'll tell you, there are some of the products that we sell on our website, okay, that can also be purchased through Amazon. So if you look at our stuff, and you can get it cheaper on Amazon, go for it. All right, but at least you know the product's been vetted. Okay, so pure encapsulation and thorn, are two of the products that we use a lot of, and their, uh, you know, their manufacturing processes are pretty close to pharmaceutical processes. So you get good quality products. So we're constantly testing and retesting the supplements that we're looking at to see whether or not they're the best bioavailable, whether or not there's been any advances. And so we wanna look at that 
at that stuff. But you do have to do your due diligence in looking at supplements.